Let us all pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavata Babaji, Lahiri Mahasaya, Swami Sri Yukteswaji, Our Guru, Paramahansa Yaganandaji, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, bless our service. Help us to feel thy presence. And bless us always. All our spiritual efforts that we may realize more and more is that we are one with thee. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. Let us begin with a short meditation. Let's close our eyes and turn our attention inward, forgetting all outer consciousness. Put yourself into the presence of God. Our subject today is, as you know, dynamic will. It can change your life. I want to do the scripture readings first for today. And they are, I think, clarifying a few points in regard to will and our actions, certain misconceptions that some people have. This from the Bible, it is the passage that you find in Mark in the 14th chapter. It was before the Passion began, just before that, and Jesus prayed to God, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And the Master explained, he said that many people misinterpret these words as meaning we should not use our own free will, but just do whatever we are told or whatever. And that, of course, is a misconception because this is actually the most important power that God has given us, will. And certainly we have to use it. And I think this is really the last point of the whole subject that I'm going to cover today, namely that we should use that will in the highest way, in harmony with God's laws, in harmony with divine righteousness, as it is called in Indian scriptures, Rita is the universal righteousness, the universal law of God which keeps everything, or tries to keep everything in harmony. And I think it takes tremendous willpower not to do our own will, the ego's will, but what is right, isn't it? Coming down to our level now, and from, you know, those great ones who went through these tremendous tests, but then coming down to our level, let's say, you are going on a diet and you're trying to lose some weight and you go for a walk and you see a new store and as you get there you see it's a bakery <laughs> and in the middle of the window is this most beautiful it's a total deception you know it appears as a beautiful chocolate cake 
And actually, it is nothing but a huge pile of calories, right? <laughs> and then you go in and you buy it and you eat it and you feel bad. Now, the proper thing, of course, is you use your discrimination, you don't go in, you walk right by, and afterwards, you don't feel bad, you feel good. <laughs> then let's go on to the Gita passage, and there it talks about the action, karma, the different kinds of actions. The real nature of karma, action, is very difficult to know. In order to understand right action, the contrary nature of wrong action and also the nature of inaction should be understood. Now, right action, of course, is anything that you perform, any action that you do, that is in harmony with God's laws. And the highest form of action, of course, is meditation. Now, all these things, all the right actions, all the efforts that we make in order to do what is right according to the divine law, that all contributes to the final attainment of oneness with God. So that is clear. So any right action really in the overall scheme leads towards the final goal of God realization. Contrary action, wrong action obviously is that which leads not towards that but away from it. Now inaction, this is a very interesting point. And uh, in the Gita and other scriptures of India this is often mentioned, inaction is the final goal of all of us. Soul realization, God realization. The soul within us is God within us. And the soul never acts, no matter how busy we are outwardly. The soul does not act, it is the pure transcendental consciousness of God within us. And that's our true self, that's our true nature. And in India also, in some of the temples in India, we see the Shiva, which is the male principle of God, is flat on his back. That represents the transcendental consciousness of God beyond creation, eternal, infinite bliss. And usually he has his consort, Mother Kali, standing on Shiva, and she has the four arms. That is always an indication in India when you see pictures or in a temple, you see the divinity in any particular aspect. If he or she has more than, is depicted with more than two arms, it always means God in activity, in creation. But the final goal is to reach that inactive state which is the transcendental, eternal bliss consciousness. Now in India that has been misunderstood by some people who think, well, it says in the scriptures, inaction, therefore I am not doing anything. And that of course is not the purpose, is not the meaning of inaction. Laziness is far from, laziness can never get us into a state of true inaction. It's the other way around, it is intense right action. And that includes meditation, which eventually leads us to that supreme state of consciousness. Now, from the commentary, from the interpretation of inaction, true inaction, Paramahansa Yogananda said, occurs when the devotee is liberated. He is then through with all compulsory forms of action. He has reached the state of inaction, that is complete freedom from the necessity of and desire for 
action. Do you understand that? It is that which is characteristic of God the Father. So, inaction then means not only the deep state of in deep meditation when everything is still and the devotee is one with that infinite bliss consciousness. It also means performing actions with only the desire to please God. That also is considered inaction, meaning no more motivated by the ego, by personal desires, or by karma, or whatever. This is then the state of a great saint who is liberated, who has transcended ego consciousness. When they come down to the physical plane, they are extremely active, as we see with Jesus, and uh, as the Master says, Baba Ji, Lari Masya, Sri Yukteswati, and all great Masters are intensely busy in actions that are spiritually helpful to humanity, even though the masters themselves have reached the state of inaction or liberation. So their action is called also inaction. All right, now let's go to the subject about dynamic will. I would like to recommend to you this book, Where There Is Light. It is really a wonderful how to live book, how to live successfully. I quote from that book. The Master said, when we begin to understand the total being that is man, we realize that he is no simple physical organism. Within him are many powers whose potential he employs in greater or lesser degree in accommodating himself to the conditions of this world. Now, he says their potential is vastly greater than the average person thinks. And that is really the subject of today. These powers are vastly greater than what we think. Behind the light in every little light bulb is a great dynamic current. And beneath every little wave is the vast ocean. And so it is with human beings. God made every man in his image and gave each one freedom. But you forget the source of your being and the unequaled power of God that is an inherent part of you. Think of it. The unequaled power of God that is an inherent part of you. You don't have to attain it. It's there. It's built in. It's inherent. And then he said the possibilities of this world are limitless. The potential progress of man is limitless. The real you is the prolific source of all power. But the everyday you is only a little fragment of that, which can be brought out and manifested. The basic you is infinite in its potentiality. And that's the thing which we are not taught. Our educational system completely ignores that. The tremendous powers that God has given us, and our educational system completely ignores to teach what these powers are, how to use them, how to develop them, and how to use them correctly for our benefit and fully. It's utterly amazing to me when I think of what in our schools, what the children are taught, those essential things, how to use those powers how to use them harmoniously in a constructive way, how to use them completely, that is totally ignored. So, the Master said the whole universe is a projection of the cosmic will of God. 
when the Gita says, God speaking, I am the progenitor and also the resolver of the cosmos. And now, that power is part of us. We are the soul. And the soul is simply a spark of that or a wave of that infinite consciousness of God. And as I said before, the soul does not act. But the soul has instruments. We have the body, we have the senses, we have the brain and the heart and all those things. And what operates that, all those various instruments, that power comes from within, from the soul. And the Master explained it this way, there is a ray of that force, of that consciousness of the soul, which goes into our brain, manifesting as the thinking principle, thought. There is another ray which goes down into the heart, manifesting as feeling. And there is another one going into the Christ center, manifesting as will. And there you have it. So, if God has created through will this whole universe, what is it? What is that will, that cosmic will? It is God's omnipotence. Now think of it, we have that same thing, we have connected. The soul is part of God. Our will, if it is properly used, is a part of that omnipotence of God. It's incredible, isn't it? How little we know and how little we use those forces that have been given to us. The Master said volition, that is will, is the dynamo that feeds all our powers. It initiates and keeps in continuous operation all of our physical, mental, and spiritual actions. Without the spring of will, we cannot walk, talk, think, work, or feel. In order not to exercise the will, one would have to lie down and enter a state of suspended animation. But now, who uses that will in a constructive, in a complete way? Very, very few people. Very, very few people. Then he goes into analyzing it. A wish implies a helpless desire of the mind. And if you analyze yourself and your thoughts, isn't it so that you think, oh, I wish I had this and that, or I wish I could do this and that, or I wish I were a saint, and all that sort of thing, isn't it? Now, a desire, he says, is a stronger wish and is often followed by fitful efforts to manifest itself into action. An intention or a determination is a definite strong desire expressed very forcefully once or twice hmm? through action for the accomplishment of a certain purpose. Such a determination, however strong, is often discouraged after one or two or several unsuccessful efforts. So all that is the very beginning. It is not willpower yet. What is will? Now he gives the definition. Will consists of a series of continuous, undiscourageable, unceasing determination and acts, revolving around a desire until it becomes dynamic enough to produce the much-craved result. That's will. And a very simple definition that he gave was, will is a desire plus energy directed toward fulfillment. In other words, it's not just a desire. And not something which is a burst of energy, I'm going to do it now, I try a few times, and then it's finished because we think, oh, I cannot do it after all. 
I'm a feather, I'm no good, or it's impossible. That is not willpower, that is a burst of emotion which burns out like a straw fire. So dynamic will is desire plus action, meaning energy, in a sense of performing actions again and again and again until that desire is fulfilled, until that goal is reached, no matter what it is. It can be money, it can be uh, in science or in art, or it can be on a spiritual path, God realization, whatever it is. That's, that's the force. And then he also says, the use of willpower developed by the practice of the self-realization fellowship methods opens up limitless possibilities for all-round success. And one of those methods, you know what it is? Energization exercises. And people think, well, I'm too, I'm too tired to do them now. And if you're doing it, it is not just bringing in energy from outside. You're developing, you're strengthening systematically your willpower. And then also he says, using the will does not necessitate physical or mental strain. You have to really understand that. Then he gives another definition. He says, exertion of conscious will means a cool, calm, determined, increasingly steady and smooth flowing effort of the attention and the whole being toward maintaining a definite goal. So it is not something emotional and burst of emotions. It's a calm, continuous flow of energy, of action, of determination, until the goal is reached. And then it talks about the evolution. The power is gradually manifesting and developing in man. It talks about the evolution of willpower. He says about the newborn baby. The first cry announced the birth of willpower. The baby cries because he wants to remove the feeling of discomfort, owing to the first painful opening and activity of the lungs. And this he called automatic physiological will. And when a baby grows up and grows old enough to talk and unquestioningly follows the wishes of its mother, it is said to possess unthinking will. And a mother calls the infant a good boy because he obeys. It's the beginning of will. It just does whatever he is taught. And then he told that story when he was a little boy and his nurse took him to a drugstore to buy something. And uh, he saw those little orange colored candies and he said, I want those candies. And they said, no, we are going home now. And when they came home, the master said to his mother, I want those candies in the drugstore. He says, no, you're going to eat now. So he ate. And then he said again, I want those orange colored candies. And she said, no, you're going to bed now. So he went to bed. Then he said, I want to have those candies. She says, no, you're going to sleep now. And then he started to make such a fuss that they had no other choice. They had to go to the drugstore and wake up the drugstore man and bring those candies and give it to him. And he was supremely happy. <laughs> the master was completely happy because for the first time he had used his own will. And then he said, never suppress the will of a child. Never. Guide it. But many people do that. They always say, no, don't. And the master said, this is the worst thing you can do for a child. Because you are suppressing the willpower. He said, don't close all the doors. Open a door. When he wants to go through a wrong door, you open the door and say, this way. Don't suppress. There's a story. There was a couple with a little boy who went to a restaurant to eat, and, uh, and the parents gave their orders, and then the waitress asked the little boy what he wanted. And uh, 
Mind you, I'm, I'm talking willpower now. I'm not talking diet, all right? <laughs> so the boy said, I want a hot dog. Mother says, no, he doesn't get a hot dog. He gets a sandwich. And the waitress completely ignored the mother. She asked the boy, what do you want on your hot dog? Do you want mustard or ketchup? <laughs> and he looked at her and said, ketchup and a glass of milk. And the waitress said, coming up, and walked off. After stunned silence, the little boy said, you know what? She thinks I'm real. <laughs> First time, perhaps, in his life, he had his own wife. Don't suppress willpower. But blind well, of course, that's not the end of it. The master says, well, at this stage is turned blind will because it is not usually guided by wisdom. Most young people use this explosive blind will without any worthwhile purpose, wasting energy and higher possibilities on passions and temptations and brawls and fast driving and rash resolutions and ungoverned appetites and so forth. Isn't it tragic? They are not taught. They are not taught. Somebody said, what a tragedy it is to waste all that energy on the young. That is not the tragedy. The tragedy is that the young people are not taught what will is and how to use it correctly. In the higher ages, we read stories of teenagers who had already were leaders of countries, kings, and all kinds of tremendous achievement. Why? Because those powers are taught correctly, how to develop them, how to use them in a constructive way. And then, of course, the final thing is, the final stage is, when that will is used in harmony with God's laws, then there is the full potential. That's the full dynamic will. There are some people who have strong willpower, but are doing something that is not in harmony with God's laws, and somehow they never come out right. Because it goes against the principle of the soul. The great villains, for instance, in history, some of them very powerful people, but they did not have the complete will because it was not in harmony with God's laws. Now, I have a letter here to Ann Landers. <laughs> and it's a very important thing that we understand. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail. You have failed many times, although you don't remember. You fell down the first time you tried to walk. You almost drowned the first time you tried to swim. Did you hit the ball the first time you swung a bat? Heavy hitters, the ones hit the most home runs, also strike out a lot. R. H. Macy his famous department store in the East, failed seven times before his store in New York caught on. English novelist John Creasy got 753 rejection slips. Think of it. Would you have stopped writing after a few hundred rejection slips? Hmm? There is that saying, if you don't first succeed, try and try again and then quit. Because, <laughs> because there is no sense of making a fool out of yourself. <laughs> now, do you know where that came from? Do you know who said that? It was that comedian in the silent movies. Fields, was that his name? He was the one that said that. It's not true. 
It's not true. The people may say he makes a fool out of himself, but he keep on and on and on. Think of it. 700, how many? 753 rejection slips. And then it turned around. Then he started. Then he published over 500 books. I don't know what the books were. It doesn't matter, really, you know. The thing is, the principal thing is, he did not give up. That's the point. He did not give up. And you never know because there is a vibration that you put into the ether. And it works. You may fail again and again and again until all of a sudden that whole thing is just right. And then the full force, nature works with you, God works for you. This is a law. In Switzerland, you know, the children usually, they start skiing at a quite early age. And I remember when I got my first pair of skis, that Sunday afternoon I went to a hill near our home where the children were skiing. I skied all afternoon. And then the next morning, my mother talked to me. And she said she got a phone call from a friend of hers. And she said that woman with her husband went to that hill to watch the children ski. And they saw me. And they watched me all afternoon. I wasn't aware of that at all. I was much too absorbed in my skiing. And she said, that boy fell. And fell. <laughs> and fell. She said they were scared to death that I would break my neck. I would break every bone in my body. And I still remember how surprised I was to hear that. <laughs> because I wasn't aware of all my faults. My whole attention, my whole concentration was, I was skiing. <laughs> but you know, that's how I learned. That's how I learned. And so the thing is, don't worry about failure. Worry about the chances you miss when you don't even try. And so it really goes on and on, you know, in any subject, any aspect of your life, be it in a material pursuit, be it health, be it karmic conditions, be it bad habits or whatever, it doesn't matter. These patterns, the negative patterns, which seem to hold us back, they can be broken, they can be changed. Master used to say it is like clay that has hardened. And we think, well, this is how I am, my obstacles are too great, and there's no point in trying. It's not true. It's not true that hard clay, the Master says, can be changed, can be softened again, and can be remolded. And when you look at some of the saints, some of them started out as real, uh, you know, failures, total failures. And then you see others who, like, there was a woman saint in Italy. At the age of six, she took a vow just on her own to dedicate her life to God. How did that happen? How did Mozart start to create music, write music, compose music at the age of four? How? Well, if it doesn't manifest in this life, next life, nothing, no effort is lost. We are taking those tendencies over into our next incarnation. Now, people say, well, you know, in this instant satisfaction society in which we live, we want everything now, isn't it? Right now. And if it doesn't come right now, what's the use? No, we have to understand those great, deep laws and apply them, apply them in anything, be it spirituality or in sports or health or whatever. You know, there are lots of stories of people who had tremendous, tremendous handicaps, and just because of those handicaps, they took that not as a restriction, but as an incentive, as a challenge. And they used that in any form, whatever it is, Developing that power within. And it all contributes. 
I often think when the Olympics come around and I see how those people, that tremendous concentration, that tremendous determination to win that gold medal, I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Just remember this. You're a child of God. And you do not know what power is within you. It is the omnipotence of God that is within you, inherent. It's there. And all you have to do is think about what is my life? Where am I going? Am I successful? And take those basic things that you want to accomplish. Don't have too many, otherwise you're splitting it all up. Just a few. In your physical life, in our material life, outside, certainly we have to play our role as best as we can. We have to live so that we are more or less healthy. And we should not neglect our spiritual striving. That's the first, that's the supreme goal. One is with God. So, when you think in your meditations or techniques that you are not very successful, that same law applies. The same power is there. And all of a sudden, gradually, you have a breakthrough. And then another one, and then another one. And it works. It's the law of God. And let us pray together. Beloved God, Beloved God. may thy love shine forever. On the altar of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. God bless you all.